Ready? Welcome, everybody. My name is Susan Gillis, and I'm the curator of the Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum. And this is our virtual lecture series, Boca History 101. This is a 10 part lecture series. Each talk will be half an hour long. And the first three lectures will be a brief overview of Boca Raton history. So for all my longtime residents, I am sure I will leave out one of your favorite topics or people due to time constraints. So I apologize in advance. Uh, in succeeding lectures, we will be exploring the pioneer era, the uh, 1920s Addison Meisner and Boca Raton, and uh, World War II in Boca Raton. Now your microphones will be muted during the presentation, but you are welcome to email us with any questions at research at bocahistory.org or curator at bocahistory.org. Uh, remembering that we may answer your question in a future talk. These lectures are being recorded, uh, and so in case you miss one or would like to review, we can provide you a link to the recording. So let's get started. Patricia, my computer is not moving my head. There we go. Hi. The Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum is a nonprofit membership organization founded in the 1970s to collect, preserve, and share artifacts and information relevant to the history of greater Boca Raton and to act as an advocate for historic preservation. Today we're in the midst of our History Alive project, which will bring new professionally designed permanent exhibits in multiple galleries to our headquarters at Historic Town Hall on Federal Highway. And to find out more about this project and possibly donate to our project, please visit our website at bocahistory.org. There you will find many resources on local history, including online history curricula for area school teachers, online exhibits, the Spanish River Papers publications, web pages on topics like Meisner and World War II, and also information on our programs, activities, tours, and special events. So to your left, I have um, listed all the various spellings that I have encountered for the name of our city, Boca Raton. These are from different maps. Uh, and I like to start off every talk with a little bit about how Boca Raton got her name. So first of all, uh, in 1982, our city council actually passed a resolution dictating the correct pronunciation, which is with a long O. So please give it a long O as in old San Antonio, pine cone, corn cone, post cone, and rezone. Very briefly, the meaning of Boca de Retones originally uh, really referred to a rocky or a jagged inlet. It was a navigational term, a historic navigation term, but we know from historic maps that the original site of Boca Ratones was actually on Biscayne Bay in the area of Miami Beach, Miami. And somehow in the early 19th century, it got associated with our Lake Boca Raton. Uh, this map is from 1839, and you can see we are most confusingly in two places at one time. Now for more information on this topic, visit our website, pull down the research tab, the Our History page, you will find embedded a PDF with a very good essay discussing the origins of our place name and the means. So first I'd like to talk about our real first settlers in the Boca Raton area. Uh, these are the pre-Columbian people, the Aboriginal peoples of Southeast Florida. Now, this is a cultural map showing the tribes in the area of South Florida at the time of Spanish conquest. 
Uh, and you may notice that Boca is kind of located on the border between Tiquesta Niega. And I have found if you ask two archaeologists, were the, these ancient people of Boca Raton Tiquesta or Niega, you're going to get two different answers. Um, it's not really important. They probably didn't call themselves that. Uh, please note that the town of Tequesta is not in Tequesta territory, and Calusa Elementary is not in Calusa territory. But uh, we archaeologists once thought this was, in fact, Calusa territory, so we forgive them for that. This is what archaeologists call our area the Glades period, uh, Glades people. That's really a time frame, as you can see. And it's indicative of certain lifestyles, certain types of pottery, and so on. Um, and our earliest known occupation site and area is about 500 BC at a site at Gumbo Limbo. There's two clusters of sites in the Boca Raton area, the Spanish River Complex and the Boca Raton Inlet Complex. And you will notice most of our, our, our archeological sites are near the beach near what would have been fresh water, um, a stream we call today the Spanish River, that's more or less where the intercoastal is today. So they like the same sort of places we do in the present. We know that these uh, native peoples of South Florida had a very rich natural environment from which to make a living uh, without needing agriculture. So they had the bounty of the sea, the rivers, the Everglades, the land for hunting and fishing. Uh, they didn't have good stone to make stone tools, but they did very well with wood, bone, and shell. And we know they did have pottery. One of our most important archaeological sites is the Barn Hill Mound. And this is a picture from 1920, roughly. Uh, and the mound was much, less, much higher than it is today. Uh, the pioneers used a lot of the dirt for local road building many, many decades ago. It is a burial mound uh, and dates possibly to AD 700 to 1300. Uh, this is a rough location of the Barnhill Mound, so it's east of Federal Highway and north of Yamato. In the 1950s and a tourist attraction impresario named E.G. Barnhill bought the site. He actually had um, legitimate archaeology by real archaeologists done on the site. And he created a tourist attraction called Ancient America. He had um, tunnels dug through the mound, and the um, interments were glassed in so you could view them. There was also a museum with North American Indian artifacts, and this funny little concrete, supposedly Spanish ship that was a landmark on Federal Highway. Now, this was uh, around at the same time at, as Africa USA, for those of you who are familiar with that, but not nearly as successful. It only lasted a few years. However, according to our longtime residents, uh, the tunnels and the little ship were still around as late as the 1970s. By the middle of the 18th century, we know the Aboriginal peoples of South Florida had departed from the area. Their surviving people literally got on the boat with the Spanish and went to Havana. But about this time, the end of the 18th century, um, the Seminole Indians, the people we call Seminole, uh, are arriving and populating South Florida. So let's talk a little bit about the Seminole in Boca Raton. Now, Boca Raton isn't really traditional Seminole territory. Uh, Fort Lauderdale and west of Fort Lauderdale uh, is where they primarily made their home. But we know, according to this early map, there was a Seminole camp west of what is today the El Rio Canal and south of what is today Palmetto Park Road. I have a few photos from our collection. At upper right is a gentleman in a dugout, probably on the what is today the intercoastal. He is not wearing a dress, that's called the big shirt. It was a fashion in the early 20th century. And the other pictures of our youngsters uh, at our Florida East Coast Railway Freight Depot, which was located north of Palmetto Park Road 
um, on the FEC tracks. Now, they were likely not residents, but possibly traveling on the train, as the Seminoles were known to do. So really, um, we have a few mentions by our early pioneers of the Seminole presence here. But by the 19 teens, I, I think they had certainly vacated the area, with an interesting exception. In the late 1940s, a man named Vernon Lamb, who was the former state archaeologist, established the Seminole Pottery on North Federal Highway, uh, north of the city. Now, back then, the city was a lot smaller, and I can't tell you exactly where this was. Um, however, Seminoles are not traditionally potters. They don't, ceramics isn't part of their traditional crafts. Uh, however, Mr. Lamb wanted to find some revenue for his Seminole friends. He taught them how to make pottery, uh, and they had this establishment and a camp um, in what is today the city limits of Boca Raton. I understand that the sorts of pots they made were not really traditional Indian style wares, but things like uh, jars shaped like oranges and so on, things to appeal to the tourist trade. So this business only lasted for a few years, probably till 51, 52, and then we don't know, it seems to have disappeared from the local area. So now let's talk about the non-Indian settlers of South Florida. First of all, I apologize. No, we didn't have pirates here, doggone it. Um, and when I talk about South Florida, I am leaving out Key West, which was populated and uh, 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 going strong a lot sooner than the rest of Southeast Florida, the mainland. We know that there were white Bahamian planters living on New River, which flows through Fort Lauderdale, as early as the 1790s. They were planting coconuts, plantains, and citrus, none of which are native species. And we know the Lake Worth region, and we're not talking about the town, but that body of water between West Palm and Palm Beach, which was once a great big freshwater lake, uh, settled as early as the 1870s. So the Second Seminole War, and this is relevant, uh, was fought between 1835 and 1842. Major William Lauderdale brings his troops from Fort Jupiter to establish the first Fort Lauderdale. There were three forts of that name, by the way. Uh, in 1838, down an inland trail, probably an Indian trail, that today we refer to as Military Trail. Is it exactly the same route? No, but that's where Military Trail gets her name. Uh, and we know that Captain Wade is marching his troops on a coastal route, which you can see on the map, all the way to what was in the third fort, the most permanent Fort Lauderdale, which was at the beach, where the South Beach parking lot is in Fort Lauderdale, opposite Big Mar. The war ends in 1842, and Florida adopts the Armed Occupation Act in 1843, which is a homesteading act. So we believe there were two, possibly three people who made claims in the area of Boca Raton through the Armed Occupation Act. Two of them are named William A. and William T. Cobb, probably father and son. And yes, I got on Ancestry and I found that William Cobb is an unbelievably common name and I didn't get very far with that particular route of inquiry. Um, however, we know they were near the beach. They were near probably that Spanish river and their claims were eight miles south of Lake Worth. So our county archeologist kindly made this map for me that shows the modern city of Delray, Boca, and Highland Beach. Um, and everything within the red rectangle could be considered eight miles south of Lake Worth because were they eight miles south of the north end, uh, the south end, or the middle of Lake Worth? We don't know. Uh, we do know there was someone named Cobb still in the area as late as 1856. Now that would be sort of the end of as far as we've gotten with the research. Um, who knows what we will find in the future. Uh, but a number of years ago, a donor came in with this small collection of artifacts 
he found on the beach near Yamato Rock after Hurricane Sandy. And you may recall Hurricane Sandy really eroded our beaches. Uh, so again, our county archaeologist said, Sue, it's likely these items were eroded out of the bluff rather than being washed ashore from, say, a shipwreck. And what are these things? Well, number one, there's a gold ring that we believe is very modern and it, what you call an intrusive artifact, part of a ramrod, a rifle escutcheon, a disc, it is not a coin, but it's a disc, the back of a metal military style button, the butt of a um, pistol or knife scabbard possibly, a military button buckle, uh, and two pieces of lead shot musket balls the diameter of which are diagnostic for that second Civil War period. So one has to question, could these have come from Captain Wade and, or some of his men? Could these have come from William A. or William T. Cobb? We may never know, but it's just an intriguing part of the puzzle. Now, the, today, what we call the intercoastal uh, was originally the Florida East Coast Canal. Um, and it was dredged beginning in the 1880s, completed in 1912 to Miami. Uh, and it would have been dredged through Boca Raton in the late 1880s. Um, and the canal uh, took advantage of existing waterways. In our case, Lake Boca Raton, Lake Wyoming, Lake Rogers, and the Spanish River. So uh, this was a transport canal, and so you could have gotten north and south on the canal as early as the late 1880s. In 1892, we're in Dade County, huge county, not a lot of people. County Commission decides to build a county road, uh, and we know that road took more or less the route of what is today the Florida East Coast Railway Dixie Highway. Uh, there's no really, really good maps of the county road, um, just these vague descriptions. Um, and a stage line ensued from Lantana to Lemon City. Lemon City is North Miami. Uh, it was the Bay Biscayne stage line. And coming south, there was a dinner stop, think lunch, uh, on the Hillsborough River, now Hillsborough Canal. Uh, and we know there was a bridge over the Hillsborough or the road. And that was somewhere in the vicinity of what is today the Dixie Highway Stimulus Flyover Bridge. I'm not sure exactly where, because the pioneers who did recall the stage stop, number one, long gone, but the only clue they left us was it was where the hickory trees grow. So unfortunately, the hickory trees are gone. Uh, and I don't know whether the stage stop was on the Boca side or the Deerfield side. But nonetheless, that stage would have come through our future Boca Raton. The stage only lasted a few years because 1895, 1896, Henry Flagler decides to extend his Florida East Coast Railway from West Palm all the way to Miami, as they said back in the day. And this is arguably the most important event in the history of our state, uh, certainly in the history of Southeast Florida, because it opened up South Florida, including Boca, for development. Now, this gentleman, Tom Rickards, was a North Florida grower, and he happened to be a surveyor. He was already in the area in the early 1890s, purchasing land, purchasing land in the area of Boca Raton, uh, what is State Broward County, and so on. So he is commissioned by the Model Land Company, which is the Florida East Coast Railway, to plat a town, really establish a town at Boca Raton. Um, and that plat was filed officially in 1896. The survey and plat were filed. So really, 1896 is sort of technically our founding date, and Tom's our founding settler. Uh, and you can see this map. Um, this is a 1900 version of the 1896 plaque. The diagonal line is the railway. Uh, the future Palmetto Park Road is at the center. The Hillsborough River is now what we call the El Rio Canal. And you can see Lake Boca Raton, 
like Wyman, like Wyman's a little out of proportion, I think. And you also see the Florida East Coast Line Canal, now the Intracoast. So Mr. Rickards brings his wife, Lizzie, his four kids. They build a house on that Intracoastal, south of what is today Palmetto Park Road. It featured a commissary to trade with local people uh, and the Indians, um, and of course a dock. And here the mail boat is arriving at the house. Uh, in the late 19th century. Early Boca Raton is a farming town. Now you will notice I spelled it with an E because our early settlers, not always, but sometimes spell it with an E, so you would say Raton. Uh, and the big crops were tomatoes, everybody in South Florida grew tomatoes, pineapples, everybody in South Florida grew pineapples, citrus, everybody in South Florida grew citrus, uh, and all sorts of winter vegetables, not to mention Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, many interesting crops. And we'll talk about this further in the talk about the pioneer era. Early Boca was home to three communities. The white community settled largely along Palmetto Park Road and around the lake. The Japanese, Japanese American community at Yamato, and yes, that's how they pronounced it, uh, located west of what is today Dixie Highway at Yamato Road, and the African American community at Pearl City. Pearl City is south of Glades Road between Dixie and Federal Highway, and today it is a historic district. So here's my very snazzy map I made for you to show the location of Boca Raton, Pearl City, and Yamato. So here are some um, images from 1915. Uh, number one, you see we are conflicted about the spelling of the town. Uh, and the gentlemen on the left are the welcoming committee for a motorcade coming from Delray to Fort Lauderdale to celebrate the opening of Dixie Highway. Dixie Highway was our first interstate. It goes, it still exists, from Miami to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And of course, this meant you could get to Boca Raton and part south by automobile. So this was very big do indeed. On your right, we have an ad by uh, Mr. Gates, who was a pioneer realtor as well as a farmer. Uh, and you can see that Boca Raton is a bright spot for bright people, that we have uh, apparently wonderful fishing in those days, um, close to transportation hubs, just as now, good hunting, 15 miles walk from the ocean beach, one hour walk from the Everglades, all sorts of fruit, pineapples, grapefruit, bananas, lemons, avocados, and all sorts of vegetables. The conveniences of home in the heart of tropical Florida. Now I have a folder in our archives called Boca Raton Reputation. And uh, I um, have a lot of fun with that. I like to collect information like promotional material on the community but also document uh, Boca Raton's um, uh, own uh, reputation, what, what they think of themselves, uh, as well as what other people think of Boca Raton. It's, it's kind of a fun topic. So this is a letter from uh, George Long, who was uh, Rickard's friend and also his agent in Boca Raton, to Tom Rickards in 1915. And he's talking about land sale in the Boca Raton area. And you can see he says, uh, Deerfield is not in it with the class of people we are getting in. So a Boca's sense of exclusivity is nothing new. I like that. Well, along comes the 1920s and everything changes. Uh, the 20s was the era of the Florida land boom. The boom was like, a Klondike gold rush. It was an awesome time to be a Florida property owner. Uh, it was a time of prosperity in America, a great social change, uh, and good roads, new roads. Um, and 
people invested in Florida because we had beaches everywhere. It was a get rich quick investment scheme. So into this picture comes this gentleman, Addison Meisner. Now he has established himself as the society architect in Palm Beach, the most famous, I would say, architect working in this Mediterranean revival style that was so very, very um, popular at the time. He did not invent the style, but he was very successful at it. And he decides he wants to get into the real estate development business, which was the popular hobby of the time. So he joins with his brother, Wilson, a lot of very wealthy backers to form the Meisner Development Corporation. They invest in land in Little Boca Raton. Um, and as you can see, Boca was, uh, Meisner did not invent or create Boca Raton, but there is no question his Boca Raton development put Boca on the proverbial map. Now, we love to name things Addison and Meisner. I just drove past the Addison Preserve recently. Um, and Meisner Park, Meisner Park Park, the Meisner Condo, the Addison Condo. Of all these places, he had nothing to do with any of them or ever saw them, with one very important exception, and that's the Addison event venue at Camino Real in Dixie. That was Meisner Development Corporation headquarters back in the mid 20s. Boca Raton, uh, because, partly because of the great publicity, becomes arguably the most famous of these Florida boom time developments and also the most infamous. Um, and we'll talk about that further in my Meisner talk. Now, people, I think, are commonly under the misconception that the Boca project was somehow uh, a fraud or a con, uh, and this could not be further from the truth. I've seen the architectural drawings, um, and the Meisner Development Corporation invested a great deal of money in infrastructure. In other words, roads, water supply, bringing power lines to the area. FPL was new back then. Um, this is not the action of a shyster. Um, you don't realize any investment on in infrastructure unless you go ahead and build and sell those residences, sell those commercial properties. So a lot of the Meisner Development Corporation advertising is devoted to reassuring people because there were fraudulent uh, boom era developments going on. People would buy land sight unseen that turned out to be underwater. Some of it probably still is. Uh, but Boca Raton development is actual, where promises are as good as the God-given soil. And some of these promises will come back to bite them, uh, as we will find out in the Meisner talk. This is, shows some of the Meisner plats. Um, Meisner development really laid out the community, particularly south of Palmetto Park Road. We know there was even a plant, a miser plant in Deerfield, so trying to move into Deerfield territory. Um, the view is looking east, the ocean is in the distance, and in the uh, foreground, uh, that Ritz-Carlton Park, which was a golf community, uh, is actually where Sugar Sand Park is today, so all the way to Military Trail, um, which is, was then was very far inland. So this concludes part one of our lecture. Next time we will take up our brief history with the discussion of what happened to the Boca Raton project and Mr. Meisner. Thank you for joining us.